Okay. Can you hear me now? May 30th, 1870. Troy veterans marched through town, out East Main Street, all the way to the old Baptist Cemetery, which we all now know as Glenwood Cemetery. They were followed by 500 townspeople. When they got there, they decorated the graves and they listened to some speeches. I understand very long speeches. Tomorrow we continue that tradition with a couple of major differences. Uh, first of all, the parade will be much shorter and so will the speeches, unless of course the invocation gets a bit wordy. Let's see if I've forgotten anything. <laughs> the parade starts at Croman at 9 o'clock, and the program at uh, Davis and Green will probably start around 9.30 as soon as everybody gets settled down there. The parade's only about 20 minutes long. So when you get to Davis and Green, there will be chairs available, and there will be water available. So uh, don't hesitate if you feel you want to sit down. There will be chairs. Um, you'll know when it's time to step off the curb. I'm told there's a very special group of people who will give you an invitation. So we encourage you to do that, and wherever you are on the parade route, uh, just fall in when you're invited. And it's a good way to get across the street down there at, uh, on Canton Street after the parade is over. So if you're a part of the parade, you don't have to worry about it. So... Please join us, and hopefully we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you, John. Appreciate that. A couple more announcements. Um, this Wednesday will be our fellowship luncheon, 12 o'clock. Please be there. Uh, June 12th, we will not have a coffee fellowship because we will have a dish-to-pass luncheon on that day. So mark that on your calendar if you'd like. Sunday, June 12th. Um, we will have a luncheon here after church. The Endless Mountains Pregnancy Care Center Baby Bottle Campaign. If you have not yet grabbed a bottle, uh, fill it up with $100 bills, and uh, we'll collect those on Father's Day. Um, and our America for Christ offering is also available for you if you'd like to make a contribution there as well. Any other announcements this morning? Miss Dina. No, I, because I require your reminding me. Uh, young, young adults, on Friday, we are going up to Elmira, to the Elmira, where are they, the Pioneers or something like that? Baseball team. Hunter Kendall, who attends the East Troy Baptist Church, is, uh, I believe, going to be pitching, and so we're going to all go up there and do that. If you want to act like you're young... <coughs> Uh, you can come along, Randall. Oh, I know, I know, I know you hear me. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then Saturday, of course, is our Saturday service, 6 o'clock. Would love to have everybody here. Charlotte, what happened to our candle? All right, okay. I mean, I don't think hot air would put that out, so it couldn't have been me. Yes, Dina? Okay. Maybe you know some young adults we'd like them to go to. Okay. Anybody else this morning? Any other announcements? Yes, Pat. A okay, ABW meeting, one thirty. So come at 12 for a good lunch. And then join the uh, ABW at 1.30. Sounds good. All right. All right. Let's proceed. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, we are thankful we can gather together in freedom to worship your name. And Lord, to, to purchase that freedom, lives 
were sacrificed for us. And so we remember them today and we are thankful for those who gave their lives so that we could have freedom to worship here this morning. Thank you for that freedom. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege that we have to gather with other believers in Jesus Christ and have that sweet fellowship with one another that we have because, Lord, you lay down your life for us. And so we celebrate that this morning. We thank you for that. We just ask that you would be blessed and honored and glorified in all of the things said and done this morning. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Would you stand? Number 210 in your hymnal, Praise to the Lord the Almighty. Praise to the Lord the Almighty, the King of creation. My soul praise him for he is thy health and salvation. All ye who hear now to his temple draw near, join me in glad adoration. Praise to the Lord who o'er all things so reigneth, shelters thee under his wings, yea, so gently sustaineth. Hast thou not seen how thy desires all have been granted in what he ordained? Praise to the Lord who doth prosper thy work and defend thee. Surely his goodness and mercy here daily attend thee. Ponder anew what the Almighty can do. With his love he befriend thee. Praise to the Lord, O let all that is in me adore him. All that hath life and breath come now with praises before him. Let the Amen sound from his people again, gladly forever adore him. You may be seated. Our first scripture reading is Luke chapter 19, verses 11 through 27. As they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable because he was near to Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. He said, therefore, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. Calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten minas and said to them, Engage in business until I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, We do not want this man to reign over us. When he returned, having received the kingdom, he ordered these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know what they had gained by doing business. The first came before him, saying, Lord, your mina has made ten minas more. And he said to him, Well done, good servant. Because you have been faithful in a very little, you shall have authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, your mina has made five minas. And he said to him, And you are to be over five cities. 
Then another came, saying, Lord, here is your mina, which I kept laid away in a handkerchief, for I was afraid of you, because you are a severe man. You take what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. He said to him, I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man, taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank, and at my coming I might have collected it with interest? And he said to those who stood by, Take the mina from him and give it to the one who has the ten minas. And they said to him, Lord, he has ten minas. I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given, but from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. But as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. I'd like to invite you to actually stand if you would, and we're just going to give a a word of thanks for those gifts, financial gifts that we have received in the offering this morning. Lord Jesus, we thank you for every gift and every giver. We thank you for those who have uh, given generously to support the work of this church and the ministry that goes on. We just ask your blessing, and we thank you for the privilege to give to you out of the great portion that you have given to us and blessed us with. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. You may be seated. This time we're going to look at our Baptist Catechism. What is forbidden in the second commandment? The second commandment forbids the worshiping of God by images or any other way not appointed in his word. What are the reasons annexed to the second commandment? The reasons annexed to the second commandment are God's sovereignty over us, his propriety in us, and the zeal he has for his own worship. Which is the third commandment? The third commandment is, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. And what is required in the third commandment? The third commandment requires the holy and reverent use of God's names, titles, attributes, ordinances, words, and works. Amen. Well, you've sat for a minute, so why don't you stand? A mighty fortress is our God, number 151 in your hymnal. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great and armed with cruel hate. On earth is not his equal. Did we in our own strength confide our striving would be losing. Were not the right man on our 
side, the man of God's own choosing. Dost ask who that may be, Christ Jesus it is he. Lord Sabaoth his name, from age to age the same, and he must win the battle. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo, For God hath willed His truth to triumph through us. The Prince of Darkness grim, we tremble not for Him. His rage we can endure, for lo, His doom is sure. So word shall fail him. That word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abideth. The Spirit and the gifts are ours through him who with the sight. Goods and kindred go, this mortal life also, the body they may kill, God's truth abideth still, his kingdom is forever. You may be seated. Our next scripture reading is Luke 19, verses 28 through 44. And when he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany, at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, whereon entering you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it, you shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you, and hem you in on every side, and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you, because you did not know the time of your visitation. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, Any needs that you would have that we could mention to the Lord? Linda. Oh.
Yeah. Yeah. Well, we need to pray for Jessica. Pray that God would God would be merciful and heal her. Yeah, it's Carl with a K. Yep. Yeah, I heard he fell again. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we need to pray for Tom Manley. Absolutely. Anyone else this morning? Yep, Dina. Pray for Texas. Pray for Buffalo. Pray for the Ukraine. Pray for seemingly untold horrors going on all around us here. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Get your hand up. Nope. Over here? Okay. What's that? Absolutely. Any update on that or just still waiting? Okay. All right. Praying for Broadus. He needs a needs a kidney. Barb. Yeah. Let's pray for Isabel. Absolutely. Yeah. Anyone else this morning? Yes. Oh, wow. Okay. All right. Let's pray for Les. Dublin one. Yeah, sure. Rich Popolo family. Yes, he passed away in uh, an accident last week. Yeah. Absolutely. Dina. Okay. Yeah. There's lots of needs that are on our heart that, that aren't mentioned out loud, right? And the Word tells us that the Holy Spirit knows those needs, and that is such an encouragement to us, isn't it? Let's go ahead and go to the Lord this morning, bringing these needs to the Lord. Lord, we thank you that we can come to you. There's no concern that we have that is too small or too insignificant that you don't care about, but rather you invite us to cast all of our cares on you because you care for us. And so, Lord, we have small needs and we have very large needs, and we think of what's going on in the Ukraine and um, the terror there, the the devastation of lives, young lives lost in Texas, Lord, and just the senseless evil of that. And Lord, we, we pray for that situation. And Lord, those who are still reeling from the the shooting in, in Buffalo in a grocery store and, and uh, just such overwhelming displays of evil, Lord, and we just pray that you would be with our country and return us to our senses and not not just our our senses, Lord, but return us to our knees. Return us to a place of following you and and repentance. Lord, we pray for Jessica, Lord, finding out she has uh, cancer again. Lord, we just pray your healing. We pray your mercy in her life, Lord, and and just lift her up and encourage her. For Tom Manley, Lord, we pray for healing and uh, help in his situation for Isabel, Lord, that you would just bring hope and strength and help to her. Lord, for uh, so many who have needs that uh, haven't been spoken out loud, but, but there's real needs there, Lord. We pray that you would meet the needs of your people. Be with Les, Lord, who has uh, double pneumonia. We pray for um, strength and, and healing, Lord, for the, the Papalo family, Lord, that's grieving the loss. Uh, there we just pray for comfort and encouragement and help Uh, lord we continue to pray that you would just uh, bless our hearts to receive from you this morning lord help us to hear your word help us to be encouraged and empowered lord to to be the church that you've called us to be lord now we pray as you've taught us to pray our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our third... Scripture reading this morning is Luke 19, verse 45 through chapter 20, verse 8. And he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold, saying to them, It is written, My house shall be a a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. 
and he was teaching daily in the temple. The chief priests and the scribes and the principal men of the people were seeking to destroy him, but they did not find anything they could do, for all the people were hanging on his words. One day, as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel, the chief priests and the scribes with the elders came up and said to him, Tell us by what authority you do these things, or who is it that gave you this authority? He answered them, I also will ask you a question. Now tell me, was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? And they discussed it with one another, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why did you not believe him? But if we say from man, all the people will stone us to death, for they are convinced that John was a prophet. So they answered that they did not know where it came from. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. This time, choir, would you come on up?
So last Sunday uh, was Randall's birthday. And he didn't come for his, I had a, listen, listen, I had a, I had a free sermon and in honor of your birth and you weren't here for it, so. And, yes, and, and as, as Charlotte aptly reminds me, I had five points for you in that free sermon. So, you missed out on a wonderful gift. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I want to talk about being overcomers, and this is part of our passage here, First John chapter 5, we'll talk about overcoming the world, and, and I want to spend just a few moments talking about the kind of world that we're living in. Uh, we, we acknowledged it in our prayer requests. We've got kids can't go to school without fear of getting shot, can't go to the grocery store, uh, so many places that are unsafe because of the lawless acts of, of evil people. And it just seems to be increasing and increasing and increasing. And um, it's heartbreaking. It's sobering. Uh, and it's, it's a little overwhelming, is, isn't it? I mean, uh, you know, you can certainly go on Facebook and you'll have people argue back and forth as to what's the right solution. And if you watch it... Uh, Enough, enough television and, and on the news, you'll watch enough to make you want to throw a brick through your television set. Uh, that seems to be my experience. I, I pretty much have shut off the news, um, not because I want to put my head in, my, in the sand and not know what's going on, but I just get tired of everybody yelling at everybody, and nobody has a proper solution. And the reality is the world is in desperate need of the church being the church and offering something to them that is different than what they're following. The problem is too much of the church is acting like the world, and so the world sees no reason to come to the church. It's a real problem. Um, You don't hear it here in this church, but in many pulpits across this country and, and across the world, Everybody that comes to church is told how wonderful they are. They're not told that they're a sinner, but rather they're told how great they are and what a blessing they are, and God wants to fulfill their destiny and make God wants to, you know, uh, they'll, tell, they'll tell Johnny 15 times not to do something. Well, you clearly didn't mean what you said the first time, or there wouldn't have been the other 14. And that kid knows that your word means 14. They clearly well, you and some of you may not Let's take a look at our text, 1 John 5, verses 1 through 5. Everyone... ...of who he was and who God was, but, but Joyce is saying, oh, you don't want to believe it's more spiritual to think of yourself as... You don't want to be a miserable, wretched than who God was, but sinner. Just say all the positive things about yourself. Now, is it is she right that we're God's creation? Yes. Isn't that interesting? Jesus wanted us to tell people to obey everything that he's commanded. That almost sounds like following laws and rules, doesn't it? It's not lawlessness. He's actually saying you need to make disciples and understand that they need to submit their lives to the authority of Jesus Christ and to his word. That's our purpose. That's our destiny. This idea that outside of that we have some uh, special individual purpose that's going to elevate us, that's not biblical. And you know what? I'm happy to think of myself as a miserable, wretched sinner. You know why? Because when I realize what God has done in me, after I have properly identified who I am, I can give him all the glory, all the honor, all the credit because he deserves it. Because it's all about him. It's not about me. If 
we read the Word of God, we will realize that we are created by God to declare the glories of God. And yes, it is significant what we believe. John says that we are to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. It's interesting, in the Gospel of John, he says the very same thing, doesn't he? He says, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And now, years later, at the end of his ministry, he writes in 1 John, and reminds them that they need to believe rightly. They need to believe that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the Son of God. Right belief is essential. We talked about the damage that the Gnostics did in the early church. With the just changed titles and, and names right? You, if you listen to enough of these guys, you'll find them. They, they declare themselves prophets. They declare themselves apostles. They have all this supposed authority, and God speaks directly to them, and I have a word for you. Well, I'll tell you what, you keep your word. I'll take the one God already gave. I'm good with that. We have modern-day Gnostics that have done a lot of damage in the church. Say, Pastor, why would you, why would you fixate and talk about this? Because I'm telling you, it has infiltrated the church in deep ways. There's a lot of people, even, even people who are sitting in churches that are preaching the gospel, they have in their library at home books by all these guys that are teaching all these things, saying, hey, you're a little God, you can have whatever you want. We need to believe rightly who Jesus is. Fully God, the only sufficient sacrifice for our salvation. Without him, we are eternally lost and under God's wrath. We are saved to declare God's greatness, not to promote our own. Overcomers have right belief. And secondly, this morning, overcomers have right actions. Verses 2 and 3, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. It's interesting, so many people, they think, why would we want to, you know, follow God? We don't want any rules. His commandments are not burdensome because we find the greatest of joy and pleasure and satisfaction when we're living in accordance with the guidelines that he's given us, don't we? And in fact, those, those, those well, we like to call them the Ten Commandments. They're kind of important, right? The society that follows those finds what? Finds satisfaction because they're not hmm, murdering each other. They're not stealing from one another. They're not taking their neighbor's wife or, or cow or whatever, <laughs> right? When you, when you follow God's commands, you find that they're not given for our, our destruction, but rather they're given for our help and instruction. They're given so that we'll demonstrate both the love of God and the love of our neighbor properly. If, if the church becomes lawless, we don't represent God at all, and we have nothing to offer. The Apostle John here says that those who are overcomers will love God and obey His commandments. Again, the problem that seems to be plaguing much of the church today is we're focused on actions that bring about our own desires and our own prosperity. If the world sees the church promoting the same ideals of greed and power that they are following, why should they bother following Christ? Don't need to go to church to be selfish. and Be that at home. And the reality is they can find the world offering that already. Maybe you remember these words from a, a few chapters ago in 1 John. Chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. John says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. We should be known as believers in Jesus Christ by our, pers our pursuit of Christ, not by our pursuit of worldly ideals. John says the world is passing away along with those desires. 
but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Notice that word does, that, that, that implies action, doesn't it? What we're doing matters. Whoever does the will of God abides forever. And notice that the believer who is not loving the world is involved in right actions. Overcomers act rightly. Now, back to our passage in, in uh, verses 2 and 3 here. What actions do we see? We see loving God and obeying His commandments. When your neighbor, your coworker, your cousin, your friend, when they observe your life, would they say of you, wow, there's somebody that loves God and obeys His commandments? Or would they have no ability to distinguish your lifestyle from theirs? Do your non-Christian friends view you as different? Or do you do all the same things with them, hang in all the same places, act all the same ways, and there's no telling between the two? I'm not trying to pick on anybody. I'm just trying to say if we're not different, we have nothing to offer. And we have a world that definitely needs something different offered to it, don't we? But if the church doesn't act like the church, we have no hope to offer the world. We live in a society literally crumbling around us. It's Again, it's heartbreaking. You, you can't watch pictures and images of, of places where children are being shot and, and peop, people can't even safely go and buy groceries because they're, they're afraid of getting shot. You, you can't watch that kind of stuff and not be horrified. And the world desperately needs help. Where should they find that help? Well, the only help they're going to find comes from God. And where, where are they going to see God's help? Through the church. But again, if the church is only pursuing its own selfish pleasures, there's nothing to offer. They need to see that we love God. They need to see that we love our neighbor. They need to see that our priorities are radically different from the world's. And we say that we want the world to change, and we'll talk about this political solution and that political... Well, the, the, there is no political solution that works. It's a heart transformation that needs to happen. It is God changing hearts. But the world needs to see that that's a possibility, that that's, that can actually happen. That's, a, that's an actual reality that could happen. And where are they going to see it? They're only going to see it if, if Christians live lives that demonstrate it. The modern-day Gnostics who are claiming that following God means piles of money and fulfilling our destiny are not helping the cause of Christ. They're doing it a great disservice. Be careful what you listen to, what you consume. There's a lot of stuff that claims to be representing God, that's representing lawlessness and the promotion of self and the diminishing of God. Thirdly, this morning, overcomers have right faith. First John 5, verse 4, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Now, this faith is a very interesting word. It gets thrown around a lot. <laughs> is there a right kind of faith and a wrong kind of faith? I would say that depends upon the object of your faith. If you have faith in Christ for salvation, that's a right kind of faith. You have faith in yourself for your own pleasures, that's not a good kind of faith. We need to define things by the Word of God. John, here, John says here that the victory that has overcome the world is our faith. Is that consistent with this statement? Mr. Osteen, release your faith. God is shifting things in your favor. That seems to have a focus on me, doesn't it? But is that what's supposed to happen with our faith? How about what Ephesians 2 verse 8 says? Boy, that's a good one, isn't it? For by grace you have been saved. Through what? Faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. So where exactly did you get that faith that is so important that overcomes the world? Where did that faith come from? God gave it. We don't even have the faith to come to Him. He gives us that too. 
What a gift. What a tremendous gift. It's not our own doing. Rather, God working so that we can have faith. And what is the the purpose of that faith? Is it so that we get everything turning in our favor? No. It's so that ultimately God is glorified. God displays His glory in those who He has called unto Himself and redeemed, and they display the very glory of God. It's all about Him. Our faith is a gift that enables us to receive salvation, not a formula so that we can manipulate God and get stuff we want. The overcomer has right faith. Not faith in ourselves, not faith in our destiny, not faith in God being manipulated for whatever we want, but faith that ultimately is in Christ and for our salvation, our redemption from sin. Now, I mentioned uh, Benny Hinn earlier as the one who talked about we are little gods running around. Costy Hinn is his nephew, who I have a couple of his books if you're ever interested in reading. They are fascinating. But he uh, was a part of Benny's ministry for a short time, and then God got a hold of him, and his eyes were open, and he left that. And now, uh, actually, he just planted a church just recently, uh, I believe in Arizona, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, but he talks about this whole concept that what is a real problem in the pr- prosperity gospel preaching is that they deny the sovereignty of God. And basically, instead of God being in charge and being sovereign, he has to be subservient to my will, which is a little crazy. Costi says this, he says, The prosperity gospel certainly denies the sovereignty of God to the extent that it demeans God to the position of a puppet and elevates man to the position of a puppet master who makes confessional demands by faith. Again, it's this idea of, and he talked about these confessional demands by faith, releasing your faith, telling God what he needs to do for you. Crazy. Overcomers do not see faith as something to use to push God around, but rather overcomers realize that the faith they receive for salvation grants them victory over the lies of the enemy. It's not about them, it's about God. Our world, my friends, is in some really big trouble. And what concerns me a lot is how much of those that supposedly represent the church are so much like the world in their pursuit of worldly pleasures and worldly things that they have nothing to offer the, offer the world. They're no different. And if we're not careful, we can fall into that same trap. We need to be careful that we believe rightly, that we act rightly, and that we understand faith rightly. Biblical overcomers have right belief. They believe that we are sinners saved by God's grace. I'm not ashamed to say that I'm a sinner because when I declare that I'm a sinner, I I then in the same context can say, but I have been saved, I have been redeemed by the glorious Jesus Christ, and I can honor Him and give Him all the praise for any good that anybody may see in me. I don't have anything good that isn't a gift from God Himself. Nothing. Biblical overcomers believe that we are not small gods. (laughs) There's one God and one only. He's kind of not willing to share that title or that position with anybody. Biblical overcomers have right actions. They love God and they obey God. They recognize that God's God's commands are not burdensome, but actually it's where we find the most satisfaction in knowing that as a loving father, he has established guidelines and boundaries for our benefit. Biblical overcomers have right actions. And finally, biblical overcomers have right faith. They recognize faith itself is a gift from God. They understand that faith is not a magical formula for getting stuff they want. Sometimes we we have faith and we and we pray and we ask the Lord to heal and that person dies. 
right? Does that mean we didn't have enough faith? Some churches will tell you that. When they do, walk out the door and don't go back. God is sovereign. Can we ask and plead God's mercy that he would heal? Yes. And does he heal sometimes? Yes, he does. Sometimes God's sovereign will is not healing. And you know what? God is sovereign and God is good and God knows what he's doing. And I need to have faith in him and trust him. That's the way it works out because he's God and I'm not. Do we understand that fully? Do we no, but will we someday? There's going to come a day we're going to say, oh, Lord, I had such a hard time then, but I see now what your ultimate plan was, and your plan was best all along. Didn't feel like it at the time. Faith isn't a magical formula for getting stuff we want. Sometimes we don't get what we want. But you know what? The one who matures in Christ, who really loves God, you know what they want? They want what God wants, not necessarily what they want. That's part of That's part of maturity as a believer in Christ. And finally, we realize that faith in Christ and his work is what gives overcomers victory over the world and its false ideals. People need to know Jesus, friends. This nonsense of being told how great you are and how all the stuff you can, it just needs to stop in the church at large. Enough already. We have what the world needs. Now what we need to do is daily live that, right? We need the Lord's help by His Holy Spirit that He would help us to live a godly life so that the world would see that and be drawn to the Savior and have their heart transformed. This country needs a whole lot of that in large doses, doesn't it? Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for how it challenges our hearts. And Lord, we ask, we plead, we beg for mercy on behalf of the the world that we live in, Lord. It, It is a world that is lost. It is a world that following its own ideals and desires has just fallen off a cliff. Lord, we ask that you would bring our nation to its senses, to repentance, and to true faith in you, Lord. Lord, we ask that the church itself, the church representative of those people all across this land, Lord, would say no to, a, to an understanding of, of Christianity that elevates themselves but, and, and instead repent of sin and, and live a Christian walk that glorifies you and diminishes ourselves. May people see true gospel as they look at the lives of those who belong to the church. Help us, Lord, by your Holy Spirit to accomplish all of this. We pray this in Christ's name and for your glory and your honor. Amen. I'd like to invite you to stand one more time, if you would, for our closing hymn, Be Still My Soul, The Lord Is On Thy Side. Amen. Number 712 in your hymnal. Be still, my soul. Bear patiently the cross of grief or pain. Leave to thy God to order and provide. In every change he faithful will remain. Be still, my soul. Thy heavenly friend through thorny ways leads to a joyful end. Be still, my soul, thy God doth under.
undertake to guide the future as he has the past. Thy hope, thy confidence, let nothing shake. All now mysterious shall be bright at last. Be still, my soul, the waves and winds still know. His voice who ruled them while he dwelt below. Be still, my soul, the hour is hailed. On when we shall be forever with the Lord, when disappointment, grief, and fear are gone, sorrow for God, love's purest joys restored. When change and tears are past, all safe and blessed we shall meet at last. I want to just remind you to stick around next door in the fellowship hall for our coffee fellowship and get to know somebody maybe a little better. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this day, this honor and privilege that we have to gather together in your name. We ask that you would empower us by your Holy Spirit to walk in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray this in your wonderful name. Amen. And God bless you.